Hey, Dirt Magicians. I've killed a lot of tomato plants in my life. Wait, Brie, aren't you here to tell me all your amazing tips to growing super healthy tomatoes? I am, that's right. But you just said you killed a whole lot of tomato plants. So? So I've made a ton of mistakes and learned so much about growing tomatoes over the year. Going from seed to harvest for tomatoes for us here in the Pacific Northwest can take up to five months to occur, which is such a long time for something to go wrong. Yeah, like unhealthy soil, pests and diseases. That's right, and as a previous urban farmer and researcher, I have seen them all. Through all of these trial and errors, I've learned a ton about growing tomatoes. And not only that, but how to do them in a way that works with nature. I found that treating the garden like an ecosystem results in healthier tomato plants and tastier tomatoes. So Dee, as you embark on growing tomatoes this year, I'm going to share with you my top 11 tricks for growing healthy tomatoes, starting with the soil and ending with harvesting. Can't wait to hear these, Brie. So, what is the first tip? Is it about soil? That's right, it is. So my first tip is to fertilize with a high nitrogen fertilizer, like blood meal or fish meal, right when you transplant the tomato and then to make sure that you lightly bury that fertilizer so that it doesn't attract animals. Tomatoes need more nutrients than many other vegetable plants because not only do they have green leafy growth, but they also fruit, which is a more complex process for the plant to do, which means it needs more energy and nutrients. However, we wanna do this in the early season because if we were to do it when the plants are starting to fruit, we would trigger green growth as opposed to that fruiting that we want, which is why I recommend doing it right at transplant. Oh yeah, that makes sense. So, let me clarify this. Does this mean that later, when my tomato plants start to flower, all of that leafy growth will make it really easy for them to start producing sugars for my fruit? Exactly, you're starting to understand plant physiology, Dee. All right, my second soil tip for growing tomatoes is to get a soil test. As I mentioned, tomatoes need a lot of nutrients. However, a lot of these exist in really high quantities naturally in the soil. So if we end up applying certain fertilizers for our tomatoes, we could be wasting our money if it just naturally exists there. Plus, if we're over applying certain nutrients, we could actually damage the tomato plants themselves. You're better off just applying the nutrients that your soil is deficient in, which you'd find out through with a soil test, and then creating a well-balanced soil for your tomatoes. But Brie, didn't you just ask me to add nitrogen? And what if it's really, really high in my soil? I make an exception for nitrogen because A, it is often needed in the highest quantity, and B, it is more easily flushed out of the soil than other nutrients. My third tip is to mulch around the base of the tomato plant with something like straw. We want to wait and do this until the tomato is at least a foot tall and the temperatures are consistently 21 degrees Celsius or 70 degrees Fahrenheit. If they're lower than that, then we actually want the black of the soil to heat up the tomato itself. But once we've hit those temperatures and that height, go ahead and mulch. And what this will do is conserve moisture in the soil for the tomato plants, which will help prevent blossom end rot. Isn't blossom end rot a disease? And how exactly will straw mulch help prevent a disease? No, it's actually a calcium deficiency that causes dark lesions on the bottom of the fruiting tomato. And inconsistent watering is usually the culprit because calcium enters the tomato plant roots through the water in the soil. So adding straw mulch actually helps prevent blossom end rot as it contains the moisture in the soil better and keeps it more consistent. It also has a few additional benefits as it protects the plant roots from fluctuating temperatures, both too hot and too cold, and it deters certain pests like flea beetle from walking on them. So wait, this means I'll have to water less and the straw mulch will deter pests? I'm all in. Just make sure when selecting a straw mulch that it A, is seed free so that you don't end up with little grass seedlings popping up and B, that it's herbicide free so that you're not accidentally bringing herbicide into the garden. We've linked the one that we like in the description box below. So my next tip is to know what kind of tomato it is that you're growing. What do you mean? Like what variety of tomato? No, I mean what kind of growth habit does your tomato have? 
If it's a determinant tomato, that means it's a bushing variety. So we A, don't need to prune, and B, a cage will work just fine. It's not going to get very tall. But if it's an indeterminate variety, then we need some kind of trellis or support that's at least six foot tall, because it will grow that high, and you will need to prune. So I can't just use a tomato cage for any tomato? I mean, it is called a tomato cage. I know, but many tomato cages are actually too short for an indeterminate tomato. As I mentioned, it gets up to six feet tall. So either make a trellis or use stakes of some kind. Well, I really do love that trellis that uh, Ashton built for me. And we did a whole video about it, so do check it out. All right, let's go on to the next tip then. My next tip is to water deeply and infrequently and at the base of the plant. Repeat after me, Dee. Hmm. Water deeply, infrequently, and at the base of the plant. So, walk me through what that means. So deeply refers to watering for a more prolonged period of time, and this allows the water to go more deeply into the soil. If you're growing in containers, this can look like water coming out at the very base of the container. Infrequently means we only want to water when the top inch of the soil is starting to feel dry. And doing this is going to promote deeper root growth, which will make the tomato plants more resilient to changing fluctuating temperatures and drought conditions. And the last part of this is watering at the base of the plant. And that's because we want to prevent watering on the leaves themselves, as that's a great place for a disease to form. Got it. Water deeply, infrequently, and at the base of the plant. And Dirt Magicians, make sure to water the like button if you're gaining value from breeze tips just like I am. <laughs> Nice one, Dee. So my next tip is about creating an ecosystem in the garden by doing companion planting with sweet alyssum and marigolds with our tomatoes. The sweet alyssum is great as it attracts a lot of predatory insects of pests of the tomatoes like aphids, and the marigolds actually release a chemical called limonene which deters white flies. Brie, working with nature is just so awesome. Not only do I have to water less because I have this mulch, but I also have to do less control for the pests because I planted these flowers. Win-win. Dirt Magicians, do let us know in the comments below whether you've planted flowers in order to manage pests in your tomatoes and whether they've worked or not. Yeah, there's a lot of great flowers that attract beneficial predatory insects into the garden. So D, for the next tip, it is a little bit more work, but it's gonna save you a lot of heartache. Tip seven is to monitor weekly for pests and diseases. So this means going out into the garden and checking on the undersides of leaves and in the inside of new growth for pests, and then looking for any discolored leaves or yellowing leaves on the tomatoes and pruning them out in case it's a disease of some kind. For more information on how to monitor and what to look for, make sure to check out our mini course on pest and disease management. We'll teach you how to be proactive in the garden so that you aren't heartbroken when some kind of insect or rodent comes in and eats your plant before you've gotten to harvest it. We'll show you how to monitor, control, and prevent pests and diseases in the garden, so check the link in the description box below for more information. You've also worked in pest management, haven't you, Brie? I did. I used to monitor for pests and diseases both in farmers' fields and in research greenhouses. So this course is an information dump of everything I learned in that process. And on that note, my next tip is all about pest and disease prevention. Once plants are at least two feet tall, remove lower leaves that are touching the soil. At this point, these lower leaves are being shaded out and not really helping with photosynthesis at all. If they touch the soil, they're more likely going to create an environment that diseases like. And also, these leaves on the soil create a little bridge for pests to walk onto and into the tomato plant. So would we remove the leaves both for the indeterminate and the determinate tomatoes? Yes. While we need to do more pruning on indeterminate tomatoes, both will benefit from having the lower leaves removed that are touching the soil. And on that note, I have a tomato tip that most people are not aware of. Only make three to four pruning cuts per week. If we do too much pruning at once, we're actually going to stress the tomato plant out as it has to heal all of the wounds where the cuts were that we made. And that is going to make it more susceptible to disease. So it's far better to prune on a weekly basis than to do it once a month in a large amount. Last year on my urban farm, I noticed a huge difference in the health and growth of my tomatoes when I kept up with weekly pruning as opposed to just doing it once a month. 
Oh, interesting. So even if I see five branches that I want to prune, I should just limit myself to about three or four branches and then do the rest the next week? Yep, exactly. Move on from that plant and get those leaves next time. All right, we're on to my last two tips, both of which are about harvesting. So D, after months of care for these tomato plants, the last thing you want is some little critter coming and eating the sweet, juicy fruit before you get to. Brie, are you the little critter? I mean, there's nothing you can do to prevent me from eating your tomatoes, but we can help prevent both rodents and birds from eating the tomatoes. And that's by harvesting not only the fully ripe tomatoes, but also the blushing ones. What do you mean by blushing? It means they are just starting to turn pink if it's a red tomato or yellow if it's a yellow tomato. And at this point, all of the nutrients and the sugars are already in the tomato. So harvesting them and ripening them off the vine means you're not gonna lose out on flavor or nutrients. Oh, I see, so that the critters aren't actually seeing them ripen up on the vine. Okay, I do have a question. My tomatoes feel like they're taking forever to ripen on the vine. Is there anything I can do to speed up that process? Well, Dee, if you're growing indeterminate, so the vining kind of tomatoes, then there is something to quicken up the ripening process, and that's in the late season, so kind of mid-August, to top the tomato plants. Cutting the top of the plant off will trigger the tomato plant to focus on ripening the fruit that it has as opposed to continuing to grow upward. Also, if you wanna learn more about the differences between indeterminate and indeterminate tomatoes, we created a whole video where we talk about the care for the different types and the pros and cons of each. So check it out here. <laughs>